so welcome and tonight we're doing text chapter six the the lessons of love and we will start on section one the introduction the relationship of anger to attack is obvious so when you're angry it's easy to attack but the relationship of anger to fear is not always so apparent and it's vital that you understand that fear is the foundation, the very first foundational stone of the ego. So from fear comes everything else. So from fear comes anger, and from anger, attack. So fear is the reason why we either defend or attack. If we fear, we create defenses. And the minute we've created a defense, we attack. And the minute we create a defense, we are attacked. And who are we attacked by? The fragments of our sleeping mind. Remember, it is all you. You are so the fundamental part of this course that needs to be completely understood with total clarity, or at least if you don't believe it as of yet, just bring yourself into the accepting of this theoretical construct until it starts to prove itself as true for you. Um, that you are the dreamer dreaming up every single character in the dream. And so if one character attacks another character, it's your characters in your play called the dream attacking one another means you are attacking you. Since you are playing both characters simultaneously, you're playing all 8 billion characters, you as the dreamer simultaneously. Every, every action any character takes is affecting every other character since you are the dreamer of all 8 billion characters on this planet. Anger always involves pro projection of separation. So the characters in the dream don't realize they're made up, they're projections of the dreamer. And so each character in the dream is dreaming as if they're autonomous, alone, singular, and therefore separated from every other character. Now you do this and you repeat this every day, not only in your daily life, but I draw attention to when you go to bed at night and you fall asleep and you dream, you find yourself in exotic places in your dream and you find yourself, so there's one you projected onto the dream and billions of, or hundreds of characters in your dream. And it's important that you real, realize that those characters that you're dreaming of while you're asleep at night in your bed are in your mind, you're making them up. So just as the dreamer has made up all 8 billion of us, you at night dream, so as above, so below, replicating the same play. You're dreaming all the characters in your dream. So if a character in your dream attacks you at night, you can't say that character attacked me. You're dreaming up both yourself in the dream and the character. So it's you attacking you. So anger always involves projection of separation, which must be ultimately accepted as one's own responsibility. So you are responsible for all of it, for every single character and how they behave. And of course, they're going to behave as reflections of one another. So if you, the character in the dream, believe something, feel something, experiences something, is in resistance to or have attack thoughts, then the characters in their dream then gravitate towards you in attacking forms. Okay, so you must be ultimately accepted as one's own responsibility rather than being blamed onto others. So non-duality means it's all me non-duality means that the entire universe is an illusionary projection it's not just illusion stop full stop doesn't exist it's it of course exists but as a projection as a misperceived projection of true reality because if you were projecting true reality which cannot be projected it gets only extended but if you were to be able to project true reality what would you what would you see pure bright bright white light of awareness it wouldn't be distinctions between characters people places things and events because you'd be projecting total truth and total truth is pure light of awareness pure consciousness pure god not that you can project it anger cannot occur unless you believe that you have been attacked and that your attack is justified in return and that you are in no res way responsible for it. And think about how in our lives, every time we're complaining and someone's behaved in a certain way, 
someone said something, someone's insulted us, it's seen as an external attack. But you have to take responsibility for that attack. And you have to ask yourself, what in me was believing this about myself? Or what in me was judging the world like this? And now it's presented as an attack, as an insult, as a, a negative word, as a negative comment. It's, I've created this. Why? So that I would find a better way not to have to experience what I then believe I'm in resistance to and what I'm in resistance to I call suffering. So given these three wholly irrational premises, the equally irrational conclusion that a brother is worthy of attack the rather than of love must follow. So I'm autonomous. I've done nothing wrong. Someone's come into my life, attacked me, wasn't me, and therefore I can now attack back or go and study martial arts. And the best form of defense is attack. So before they attack, you attack them. And you justify it because you believe in you're separate and therefore you believe you're a victim of this world and this world is out to get you and destroy your specialness and what makes you unique and better and different. What can be expected from insane premises except an insane conclusion? The way to undo it, the only way to undo an insane conclusion is to consider the sanity of the premises on which it rests, the foundation of this insane conclusion. You cannot be attacked. Attack has no justification and you are responsible for what you believe. So if you take these three foundations, number one, you cannot be attacked. If you are being attacked or you believe you're being attacked, you're in wrong mindedness. Attack has no justification because there is no one to attack you. It's all you, okay? And since it's all you, you are responsible for what appears to be you and others that are attacking you because you are the dreamer that has dreamt up all 8 billion people in, on this planet and throughout the universe. You have been asked to take me as your model. And that is the purpose of Jesus, not to be worshipped as a God or a holy son of God above you. The purpose of Jesus incarnating as the awakened part of the mind was to come and demonstrate that death wasn't real. Resurrection is indeed true, and ascension is the only way to go. So you have been asked to take me as your model. You could have taken Buddha as a model, but you wouldn't be doing Course in Miracles. Same, same model, just a different language. Okay. Since extreme example is particularly a helpful learning device, and, and there's a reason why he's talking about extreme example, because he's not asking you to be crucified in order to wake up. This is vital in your understanding and vital as a foundation of your understanding of yourself, your Holy Son of God self. Everyone teaches and teaches all the time. Whether you're demonstrating someone, leading by example, sharing a better way of doing things, teaching as a school teacher does or a lecturer or professor, giving other people guidance, we're always teaching. And obviously we're always teaching what we want to be and what we believe we are and what we want to understand. So we can't teach something we don't understand. It's impossible. And so we teach what we've learned in order to reinforce its understanding in us, whether we're aware that we're doing that or not. And this is a responsibility you inevitably assume the moment you accept any premise at all, and no one can organize his life without some thought system and this is what this course is doing. It's changing our thought system or the one which, with whom we think either the ego, which isn't true and dissolves the light of awareness, or that which is the memory of God and temporarily true as our Holy Spirit. Once you have developed a thought system of any kind, you live by it and teach it by example or in your words. Your capacity for allegiance to a thought system may be placed, like you may believe in wrong-mindedness, but it's still a form of faith that can, that, that is and can be redirected. So if you believe you're a body, you teach that the world consists of bodies. If you believe that you're a spirit, mind, right-mindedness, you then start to demonstrate it, live by its foundational understanding, and your life shifts as a consequence because you... You, you are what you believe and you behave in what you believe you are. And that's a fundamental understanding 
and whether you believe you're an ego or you believe you're the Holy Son of God, either way will play out for you based on what you believe you are. And so what the course is asking you to do in the introduction is believe at least in the, in the simplest way, just give a little bit of po possibility to that belief. And the minute you willingly allow yourself to be shown, that possibility grows and takes your previous beliefs in that you're a body that comes to this earth, lives and dies, and then starts to shift it and makes you realize you're not a body. And as a consequence of that, your extension, no longer manifestation, to manifest is to make, to, to create is to extend. Your life changes from making to extending, from manifesting to creating. We now move to part two, the message of the crucifixion. And, and why is this so important? And it is vitally important. Of course, every part of the course is, but this one especially is important for the reason that most of us that come the weight of the course started our life with dogmatic, fundamental Christian doctrine, where we believe God's son came to earth, his only begotten son, to die for our sins. And therefore, we believe that the crucifixion happened. And we believe not only did Jesus get crucified, he died, got buried. On the third day, rose again and ascended into heaven. And whether you believe in the fact that he died for your sins or not, it's still somewhere there in your subconscious because you've heard it so many times. And you believe that Jesus is the son of God, not you. You're a child of God, but not a son of God, which is just a crazy separate distinction, meaning the same thing. But it's, it starts to bring you into the possibility, because if you'd never heard of a Jesus being crucified, dying, resurrection, resurrecting and ascending, you wouldn't believe it's at all possible. Of course, you still believe it's impossible for you because you don't equate yourself with Jesus, which the course is trying to teach you is that you are identical in every aspect, except in your physical experience, because you're playing out different stories in the dream. And therefore, because you're identical to that thought in form, which was Jesus, which ascended in consciousness and became the Christ or the Christ awakened mind, not only is it possible, it's probable that you will achieve it and can achieve it and must achieve it because every single character in the dream will ascend, not necessarily through the crucifixion and a physical resurrection, but will ascend in consciousness, not in physicality, because physicality cannot ascend because it's not real. Only what ascends is actually the ascension is actually the returning back, the returning of the original self back to its source. So the message of the crucifixion and, and, and why I say this is important because it has to, it's going to change your mind as to why it happened and the meaning behind it. Now, bear with me. This is a fairly long chapter, and it's important that I go through it with total clarity and, and very concise in order to bring about total clarity. And please hold on to your questions so that when we take a break, you can fire away. And those of you that aren't in the question answer forum as the live um, Zoom feed right now, just please post your questions on the Zoom, on the YouTube um, platform, and I will answer them as soon as, as I have the ability to get to them. So within a week, I'll answer them. So for learning purposes, and remember learning in, in the course is really not learning, you're unlearning the ego behavior and remembering the truth of what you are and therefore the truth. Let's use this worldly language right now for learning purposes. Let us consider the crucifixion again. I did not dwell on it. This is Christ Jesus talking to us. Before, because of the fearful connotation you may associate with it. So he needed to lead you into the course, at least into miracle-minded understanding, and most importantly, the non-duality of this curriculum, the mysticism of this curriculum, which is non-duality. The only emphasis laid upon it so far has been that it was not a form of punishment. It wasn't God punishing me, although it may have appeared that people were punishing me for something they didn't agree and believe on. Nothing, however, can be explained in negative terms only, obviously. 
there is a positive interpretation of the crucifixion. And this is vital that we understand that. That is wholly devoid of fear and therefore wholly benign. So in other words, positive and caring in what it teaches if it is properly understood. The benign in, in what it teaches means it's really looking out for your greater good and all of our greater good. Crucifixion is, let me just change color just to highlight this. The crucifixion is nothing more than an extreme example. Let's just say that before two passages ago. It's value like the value of any teaching device. So it's now alluding to the fact that the crucifixion or the telling of that story is actually a teaching device lies solely in the kind of learning it facilitates. It can either be for fear or it can be for love. It can either be to keep you in the dream or awaken you. It depends who's telling the story and whether they're consciously aware or not of why they're telling the story. But if they tell the story from a place of fear and guilt because the Son of God got crucified, they're going to tell the story from a fearful and guilty way, therefore inducing fear and guilt in the, in, the, in the eye of the, the, the learner, the student. It can be and has been misunderstood. And this is why you often hear me saying that I don't place a lot of emphasis on the New Testament, never mind the Old Testament, that you just throw away in, in, in the dustbin. Yes, it has some nice you know, Psalms and, and Daniel's book, but all of it is just really history and it's a culmination of a lot of books. The New Testament, however, although it is the, you know, written a couple of, well, 60, 80, 120, 180 years after Jesus left the earth. So no one that wrote the New Testament had ever met him. So they were just regurgitating stories from their dualistic understanding of it. They, of course, told the story incorrectly. So it can and has been misunderstood. However, if you go back to the Bible and only read the teachings of Jesus, not what he did, and forget about the water to wine and walking water, Listen to the teachings, read the teachings from a non-dual perspective. It's as beautiful as the non-dual teachings of Advita, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, or the Course in Miracles. It's just as beautiful because non-duality is one and the same, perhaps told in slightly different words, in slightly different stories, but the meaning of non-dual if it's non-dual, it's non-dual in any which way you tell it. Okay? So it has been misunderstood. This is only because the fearful are apt to perceive fearfully. He's talking of, his of the disciples that wrote the book, the, the authors of the Bible. I have already told you that you can always call on me to share my decision and thus make it stronger. So the decision for the non-dual understanding. I have also told you, this is obviously a part of your mind, Christ's mind talking to you, that the crucifixion was the last useless journey. The sonship, not Jesus, collectively, because it's the dreamer taking this dream. And as he dreams the resurrection, ascension, and, and awakening of one of his characters, then he starts to realize he's dreaming. And that it represents release from fear to anyone who understands it. So the purpose of the the crucifixion is really representing the release from fear. And what have what has the church done to the crucifixion? And you've seen hundreds of movies, you know. Um, it's about creating fear and what horrible things were done to Jesus by other horrible people. Never us. We're innocent. And we feel guilty that Jesus was attacked. And we wish we could jump into the movie scene and, 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 and kill all the baddies. Well, I certainly did as a child. You know, I wanted to go save Jesus. I wish I had a time. I wanted to create a time machine so I could go save Jesus. That would have been interesting. Okay. While I emphasize only that there is the resurrection before, the purpose of the crucifixion and how it actually led to the resurrection was not clarified then. But now you're ready because it's non-duality. So understand, imagine this. Now you're dreaming and imagine you're dreaming you're Jesus. And you want to demonstrate to the rest of your brother dreaming characters that death isn't real. What would you do? You'd plan some way to die in order to demonstrate dying, resurrection, ascension. You can see that the script that Jesus played, the script of his life, was planned by the awakened, anointed Holy Spirit mind. And so the character, the fragmented character in the dream, 
the dreamer's mind that was most awake, then projected into physicality, incarnated as the man Jesus. But since it's the same dreamer, it's all of us actually undergo and still do undergo daily crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. Well, many people on this earth go through crucifixion, 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 crucifixion every single day of their life, never get to resurrection and certainly don't get to awakening, enlightenment. And what is enlightenment? My best way of explaining it, um, I've taken this directly from Rupert Spira, is enlightenment is the knowing, the conscious knowing of one's being as the essential nature of ourself, as the essence that we share with our source God. Nevertheless, and as a definite contribution to make to your own life, we're talking about the, the understanding of the crucifixion and, and obviously the resurrection. And if you will consider it without fear, it will help you understand your own role as a teacher. Why teacher for God? Because you are every day of your life, you wake up and you've just resurrected because you go to sleep, you, you're, you're dying. Crucifixion. You wake up in the morning, resurrection. Now, do you put yourself straight back into crucifixion through your thoughts or do you stay in the resurrected state of consciousness? Eventually, stay in the resurrected state of consciousness long enough the awakened state, and what happens? Ascension. The body-mind dissolves, and you, as a Christ, return to the Christ mind. What happens to you as an individual spirit body-mind? You dissolve in the light of Christ awareness, and the dreamer awakens. And so I'm going to highlight this in super purple because purple is a beautiful crucifixion color. You have probably reacted for years as if you were being crucified. Think about it this year this day, this week, this month, the last two years of COVID, and now the, the new monkeypox. <laughs> what else can the ego come up with? Of course, it's from West Africa. They don't mention which country, just West Africa, deep, darkest West Africa, where we in Africa have no idea that it exists, but the Americans have figured it out that it's monkeypox, which is just nonsense, doesn't exist. But buy into it, make it real for you, and it exists for you, and it'll manifest for you. Okay. You have probably reacted for years as if you've been crucified and you did it today. Think about it your day-to-day. -day. How many times have you complained over what someone said to you? How many times did you feel like a victim today? How many times today did you think the world is unfair, that it's unjust, that the justice doesn't end, that the world is cruel, that people are being, you know, people are being attacked and are suffering in the war, whatever the war is, or that you've been attacked, you've been suffered, that you've been insulted. Every time you think a negative thought where you're resisting to what is, you have crucified yourself. Or you believe you're being crucified. This is a market tendency of the separated. So don't now beat yourself up. It's just wrong-mindedness. Part of you is right-minded. It's part of you that is still there in the wrong mind. If it wasn't, you wouldn't be listening to me. You'd be sitting there in total silence drinking Jack Daniels, smoking cigarettes, and just being happy. Jack Daniels is cigarettes. Well, first of all, Jack Daniels is a spirit, so it's a very spiritual thing. And cigarettes, you know, you light it, so it's enlightening. So it's a spiritual enlightenment when you drink Jack Daniels and smoke a cigarette at the same time. And that's my story, and I'm hanging on to it. <laughs> and I'm sure I could write a book about how Jack Daniels and cigarettes enlighten me, but it is said with tongue-in-cheek, and I'm winking, which means it's not true. But you can believe it if you want to. Okay, so there's a marked tendency um, of the separated who always refuse to consider what they have done to themselves. So holy teacher for God, holy son of God, you've dreamt this whole thing up. And no matter what happens to you, I know it may be almost or at present inconceivable to believe that you are holy spirit. Holy, W-H-O, spirit and h O-L-L-Y, spirit, you're both. You are the same thing. You are Holy Spirit. And it's inconceivable for you to, right now in body-mind, imagine that you, Holy Son of God, created this entire universe and are now experiencing yourself from one of your fractured projections. But until you accept that foundational premises as possible and possibly true, it can never be true for you. And so then put this book down and walk away. Because this book is about 
gently guiding you to the full realization without trying to plant seeds and then make you believe it because you believe it, but trying to show you through your own experience without any projection and only a gentle right-minded perception without projection that you have created all of this and therefore you are doing it to yourself. And until you get to that fundamental grasp, you cannot transcend the dream because you won't recognize yourself as a fractured thought in form projecting into a physical body-mind form in the dream. And therefore, you as the dreamer will not awake. It's not like you can awaken and the dreamer stays sleeping. You, your awakening, your greatest gift to the dreamer and to your brotherhood is your self-awakening. It's not by helping others. You help others by your awakening because you are that lantern that gets lit, lighting up a darkened mind, a room of the darkened mind. And the more lanterns enlighten themselves, the mind eventually awakes to the light of awareness. And as we said before at the beginning of this introduction, projection means anger. So what you see in the world, you didn't make it beautiful sunset. You've made the universe, the world, in anger because you forgot what you were. And it's nice to romanticize the whole thing and say, well, you know, God created this beautiful sunset and the beautiful oceans and the beautiful mountains. Well, stop for a second, dive into the ocean, and let's see how long you swim before Jaws has you for dinner. Or go into the beautiful mountain and sit quietly under the Bodhi tree and see how long you last before Tigger comes and has you for lunch. And go and fly in the wonderful skyline and, you know, and then how long before a Jumbo 747 swallows you up into its massive engine? Everything in this dream is designed to kill you and at least designed to incite fear and definitely to get that fear to grow in you until you project it out, outwardly and attack the world because you're feeling victimized. And so projection means anger, and anger fosters assault, and assault promotes fear. A perfectly uh, self-referencing, circular referencing on itself. So you get projection, anger, fear, assault, anger, fear, assault, and you stay trapped believing it's being done to you and that you're special, you're innocent, you've done nothing wrong. And of course, all your horrible thoughts aren't true because it's just thought and this is real and thought isn't, not realizing that this is just a projection of thought. And so you stay trapped in the dream. Hopefully that by appeasing your God, praising your God, dying, uh, or your God died for you and his blood saved you. Now you're going to wait for that day. And that's why people are so afraid to die, even if they have their strongest, the strongest faith in a Jesus or a God, because deep within, they know that although they're heading in the right direction by believing in a Jesus and believing in a God, regardless of what we call God, be God or, or Buddha or Allah, same one God, just called by different names by us, the fact that we haven't fully understood what we are in relationship and in relation to that which created us is what holds us in fear because we're always wondering what about the punishment? What about the wrongdoing? What about the fear, sin, guilt? The real meaning of the crucifixion lies in the apparent intensity of the assault, excuse me, of some of the sons of gods upon another because they crucified and they beat him up, they whipped him, lashed him in the most severe way, nailed him to the cross, stuck a spear into him. They attacked him. So bodies in the ego's world of dreams, bodies kill bodies. And this, of course, is impossible and must be fully resolved as impossible. Otherwise, I cannot serve as a model for learning. And what he's talking about as impossible is the, the fact that bodies killing bodies is just an illusionary perceived projection of the dreamer killing himself or believing himself 
fallible and therefore can die because death is not possible to the awakened mind. Assault can ultimately, ma- assault can ultimately be made by only on the body. And there's little doubt of that one. Okay. There's little doubt that one body can assault another and even destroy it. We see it. It happens every day on the television, war and murder and so on. Yet if destruction itself is impossible, since nothing real can be threatened, anything that is destructible cannot be real. Here's the first line of the course. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. It's destruction, therefore, does not justify anger. To the extent at which you believe that it does, you are accepting the false premises and teaching them to others. And that's why religious teachers, in all their greatest intentions, get up on the pulpit and and shout from from the pulpit, fear and damnation and give your life and sacrifice and you're sinners and, you know, it's only because Jesus died for you on the cross that you are saved. Therefore, inducing guilt in you because you are a sinner unworthy of God unless Jesus had intervened, interceded. The message of the crucifixion was intended to teach that it was not necessary to perceive, to perceive any form of assault in the, in the persecution because you cannot be persecuted. You are persecuting but you can persecute yourself or believe that you can, but you cannot be persecuted because what God created whole and complete cannot die or be damaged or hurt in any way. And so if you respond with anger to anything, anything a brother does, any politician, any country does with anger, you must be equating yourself with the destructible and are therefore regarding yourself insanely Okay, you're regarding yourself insanely as in wrong mindedness. I have made it perfectly clear that I am like you and you are like me. As I started this talk, I, I, started, I said this to you, that you have to understand and be perfectly clear. Oh, perfectly clear. I am like you and you are like me in every single way. Okay, and until you understand that Jesus isn't the only son of God and you are just a child, but that you are equal, equal fractured aspects of the same son of God dreaming's mind. You cannot transcend and waken because transcending isn't believing in that you are spirit and the essence of God while believing in the world. You can only believe in one truth and the world isn't true. The universe isn't true so that you cannot believe, you can't believe in what is true and what is false simultaneously because it will hold you in bondage and you'll beat yourself over it uh, up over it okay so i've made it perfectly clear that i'm like you and you are like me but our fundamental equal but our fundamental equality can be demonstrated only through joint decision so to truly be jesus like jesus the christ the awakened jesus you have to demonstrated through your joint decision with that which is the Christ awakened mind. You cannot do it on your own, nor could Jesus do it on his own, and hence the Holy Spirit anointed him with the awakening. And now that Jesus, the Christ, the Christ mind and the Holy Spirit are one, infused one mind, it, it's your decision to infuse with Christ, the Holy Spirit mind. And through that joint decision, you and the Christ mind, you awake and you become free. You are free to perceive yourself as persecuted if you choose. And this is the beauty of God. You won't force anything upon it. So his Holy Spirit in the dream will not force us. The Christ will not force us to awaken because you're not ready for it anyway. And what I mean, you're not ready for it. You're not really willing to let go of this identity. If you were, you would have no more attachment to anything in this world. When you do, you choose to react that way. However, you might remember that I was persecuted as the world judges and did not share this evaluation for myself. So Jesus did no, in no way suffer because he didn't evaluate from a place of duality where suffering is the norm. Perhaps, and most likely the body experienced pain, of course, crucifixion being whipped, but in his mind, he was not suffering. Suffering is not necessarily physical. 
suffering is the interpretation of physical experience as suffering. So you could suffer the cold, you could suffer the, the heat, you could suffer from too much fluids, or you could suffer from too, you could suffer, but suffering is the fact that you're resisting the experience. And because I did not share it, I did not strengthen it, nor does he still. I have therefore offered a different interpretation of attack. And the one I want to share with you, if you will believe it, and you will help me teach it. So he's not forcing on you, saying, if you're willing to look at another perspective, I will gladly share it with you if you are willing to at least give it some attention, some possibility, and some contemplation. And as you do, you'll realize that what I teach is indeed true because you've tried every other way. You haven't, it hasn't worked. So can you at least consider trying a new way, a course in miracles way? And this is Christ speaking and saying, as I've said before, as you teach, so shall you learn. Why? Because you teach that which you most want to learn. And once you've gotten to a place where you completely understand what you're teaching, you then transcend that understanding into knowing, and then you become a super teacher. Or you may just decide to go quiet because then you just embody it and have no need to teach anything, but you teach through your beingness, through the sheer presence of the Christ in your awareness as yourself. If you react as if you are persecuted, you are teaching persecution. So be aware, teacher for God, that daily, whether you're in front of a classroom or not, just your everyday daily activity, that you don't spend your life sharing your stories of woe, how you suffered, how you've been through AA or BB or A Soul School, and how you've transcended. Now your father was horrible, and your mother was a witch, and your uncle was a clown, and how the schools bullied you and how the world is this horrible place. And now your wife cheated and your husband was a horse's bum. And, and, and the minute you do that, you're admitting that you feel persecuted, attacked and unjustly done by. So when you're sharing your day with your friends or even thinking about it to yourself, are you judging yourself as victim and others are attacking you and people have done you in? And then worse, you take those thoughts and you voice them, therefore making it vibrational resonance for you, therefore making it an extension of you, and therefore making your suffering real for you, the observer, the decision maker who perceives your life as if you are life itself living through a body mind. Be wary of this teacher for God. Step above the battlefield. Watch your words, watch your thoughts that become your words. What your words have become your actions, what your actions they become you in the Bible. This is taught. This is not a lesson a son of God should want to teach. If he is to realize his own salvation, it won't be shown you by someone else. You'll be shown you by the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? The memory of you, of God in you. It's your willingness to go within where it is released and made known to yourself. Rather, teach your own perfect immunity. This body may appear to die, but I am, it is eternal, is the Son of God, which is the truth in you, and realize that it cannot be attacked. It cannot be assailed. It cannot be destroyed. Do not try and protect yourself, or you will believe that it is assailable. And we can get into defensiveness, and we can rationalize, and we can find a thousand reasons to justify our defend attack actions and thoughts. You are not asked to be crucified, which was part of my own teaching contribution. And why are you not asked to go through the same thing? Well, he's gone through it. He's awoken. He, Jesus, who's become Christ. And now if you access that experience in the mind, you no longer have to experience it. And so he came so that you wouldn't have to, so all a billion of us didn't have to crucify ourselves every day or be crucified by others in order to resurrect the saint. You are merely asked to follow my examples, follow in my footsteps, okay, in the face of a much less extreme temptation to misperceive and not to accept them as false justifications for anger. 
there can be no justification for the unjustifiable because it's not justified because it didn't truly happen in terms of physicality. It's a mental crucifixion. It's a mental resurrection. And it's a conscious uh, ascension into full awakening. Do not believe there is and do not teach that there is. Remember always that what you believe you will teach. Believe with me, believe what? Resurrection, ascension. And it will, and we will become equal as teachers because you'll start to demonstrate it in your unconditional love of all because you realize what you see as others are extensions of you, the dreamer. And so how can you ever attack a brother? How can you ever be anything but kind? and generous and caring and loving and, and protective. Your resurrection is your awakening. Okay, so let's understand this. Everybody wants to be enlightened. Okay? Everybody wants to be enlightened because everybody believes enlightenment equals happiness or enlightenment equals super, super magic and I can manifest like a genie out of a bottle and want for nothing. Once you really realize what you are and you awaken, you won't want to manifest anything because you realize I'm just manifesting untruths, illusions. So resurrection is awakening. Resurrection is you once again resurrect your conscious awareness to your true reality or immortal reality, which is you are the son of God and you've never left. You are the son of God, which is an extension of God's love. You are the son of God, which is God's kingdom. So Jesus Christ. Christ is saying, I am the model for rebirth, but rebirth itself is merely the dawning of on your mind of what is already in it. So it's clearly telling you the resurrection is already within you. Your awakening is already within you. The script is written. God placed it there himself. God placed it there himself. And so it is true forever. And this is actually the only truth there is. I believed in it and therefore accepted it as true for me, hence resurrection and ascension. Help me to teach it to our brothers, because they're all parts of the fractured dream, dream is mind, in the name of the kingdom of God, the name of the kingdom in yourself. But first believe that it is true, if it, that it is true for you, or you will teach a miss. And many an unreal teacher tries to teach Course in Miracles, and I hear so many people on YouTube. I saw one the other day with Rupert Spira. And there's this lady, she's really ill. And I feel so much for her. I really, my heart goes out to her. And she got cancer. Didn't comment. She had studied the course for 20 years. And, you know, it couldn't help her. And now she's listening to Rupert. And in Rupert's answer is exactly the same answer as A Course in Miracles. Is that you can transcend this. This is a belief you have. And you don't have to give up the world and, and deny the fact that you have cancer, but deny the fact that you as the Holy Son can in any way be truly harmed. All that harms, that is harmed, is the appearance, the false projection of a body-mind, which isn't your truth. So if that body-mind was to be destroyed, the true essence of what you are remains in the mind and becomes the mind itself, the awakened mind. My brother slept during the agony in the garden where he agonized over the crucifixion to come. But I could not be angry with him because I knew I would not be abandoned. God would not abandon me. Why? Because I'm still in God's mind. And I'm sorry when my brothers do not share my decision to hear only one voice, capital V, Holy Spirit voice, God's voice, God's memory in a voice form because it weakens them as teachers and as learners. And yet I know they, they cannot really betray themselves or me, and that it is still on them that I must build my church. What is the church? The, the temple, what is the temple? The kingdom, what is the kingdom? The memory of God. And why is Christ's mind wanting to build the temple in our heart? Because our heart is the only part of us which is wholly true, and the rest is an illusionary projected perception. There is no choice in this because only you can be the foundation of God's church. You are the God's church. You are God's temple. You are the place in space where God resides and get rid of space and place. And what remains 
only God. Be here now. A church is where the altar is. And the presence of the altar is what makes the church holy. What is the altar? Your heart. A church that does not inspire love, heart that doesn't inspire love, has a hidden altar that is not serving the purpose for which God intended to be, because he placed the memory of him in your heart, temple, okay, so that you could realize it and then extend it, and as you extend it becomes the church. I must found his church on you, because those who accept me as a model are literally my disciples. So teachers for God, what are you in essence? You're the disciple of the Christ mind. Disciples are followers. And if the model they follow has chosen to save them, pain in all respects, okay, they are unwise not to follow him because that's what we ultimately want to escape, the suffering and no eternal joy. I elected for your sake and mine to demonstrate that the most outrageous assault as judged by the ego, does not matter. The crucifixion does not matter. As the world judges these things, but not as God knows them. I was betrayed, abandoned, beaten, torn, and finally killed. It was clear that this was only because of the projections of others onto me. He had no need for it. He came to demonstrate. Since I have not armed anyone and have healed many, We are still equal learners. Why? Why is Christ saying he's equal learner to us? Well, because he is the he has taken full responsibility for being the dreamer, and the rest of the characters are still returning through learning. Some aware, some unaware. Okay. So we are still equal as learners, although we do not have equal experiences, but we're equal in every other way. The difference between you and Christ is the appearance of space-time and the appearance of a heightened state of conscious awareness in what appears to be Jesus, but actually it's all you, the dreamer. And so if it's in what appears to be a projection called Jesus, it's in appearance called you. It's in all of us. The Holy Spirit is glad when you can learn from mine and be reawakened by them. Why? Because it's the memory of God in both of us. That is their only purpose. And that is the only way which I can be perceived as the way the truth, and the life. If you do not perceive the Christ mind as the only way, the only truth, and the only life, because it's life itself, you will be seeking outside yourself in the worship of a deity, of a worship of people, places, things, and events, and never find it, because the ego's foundational doctrine is seek and do not find. When you hear only one voice, you are never called on to sacrifice. So I seek mercy, okay, forgiveness, not sacrifice. I seek mercy. Okay. On the contrary, by being able to hear the Holy Spirit in others, you can, you can learn from their experiences and can gain from them without experiencing them directly yourself. So you can understand the crucifixion without having to be crucified if you understand it from a right-minded perspective. That is because the Holy Spirit is one. So the Holy Spirit appears to be in my mind and all 8 billion of us minds. Why? Because there's only holy, one mind and there's only one Holy Spirit. That is because the Holy Spirit is one. And anyone who listens to the memory of God it is, is inevitably led to demonstrate his way for all. You are not persecuted, nor was I. You are not asked to repeat my experiences because because the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you have no need to. It's already done. Because the Holy Spirit, who, whom we share, there's only one Holy Spirit, only one mind, makes us unnecessary. So you can share from another character in your dream. To use my experiences constructively, however, you must still follow my example in how to perceive them. Because that's the, that's the wrong mind of upside down thinking. My brothers and yours are constantly engaged in justifying the unjustifiable way of the ego. My one lesson which I must teach as I learned it is 
that no perception is out of accord with the judgment of the Holy Spirit of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit can be justified, meaning very clearly that whichever way it's going to be looked upon, it's going to be looked upon by the Holy Spirit as not real. So whatever sin you think you've created in physicality, you have not because the Holy Spirit would guide it untrue. I undertook to show you this was true in an extreme case through the resurrection and ascension, merely because it would serve as a good teaching aid. Why? It would be planted in our mind that reality is an illusion, for example, to those whose temptation to give into anger and assault would not be so extreme. I will with, I will with God that none of his sons should suffer. God doesn't want us any to suffer. And if we suit, we do. It's by our own beliefs and suffering. Now, tell that to someone who's dying of cancer and doesn't understand non-duality, and they'll get so angry with you because they'll go, I didn't do this to me. God's punishing me, or I've got cancer because I was some karmic imprint. And they don't take responsibility for being here now. The crucifixion cannot be shed because it is a symbol of projection. So the crucifixion is a symbol of projection. And and yet so many people wear that around their necks. I used to. But the resurrection and the awakening is the symbol of sharing because the reawakening of every son of God is necessary to enable the whole sonship, I'm adding that word there, to know its wholeness. So the only way we know we are one is when we collectively awake. So the, what can you do for that one? You awaken and you extend it through your passionate nature. Only this is knowledge. What we what surpasses for knowledge in the world, the greatest brains understanding quantum physics, quantum thermodynamics, science, geometry, psychology, all of that may know all of that. What does it know? It knows the makeup of the illusion. True knowing is the knowing of your essential self celebrated as a joyous expression here now. So the message of the crucifixion is perfectly clear. Teach only love, for that is what you are. If you interpret the crucifixion in any other way, as in God sacrificed his son so the rest of us could be forgiven, you are using it as a weapon for assault rather than the call for peace which it, in which it was intended. Why are you calling for assault? Well, because you're calling for assault on other people, so they want, you want them to feel guilty. Or you want to blame someone else for having done it and then justify your means. And of course, if you can you know, translate it and project it onto another nation, another country, another tribe, then you can justify it by standing in your own and believe that you're a special worthy of God or whatever the case, God's chosen nation. And now you can attack everybody else. And that's how quickly this nonsensical reinterpretation of the true word is made by the ego and before you know it it becomes the norm and we start to believe and if you look 2000 years later we now believe in a fundamentally flawed foundation to religion and spirituality and the premise is if you don't realize you are that which dreams this whole thing up and that which dreams is the holy son of god if you're not willing to go there You'll be stuck in the stream for a very, very long time. And you'll go kicking and screaming when the rapture happens, which really means rapture, the ending of the dream. The apostles, so apostles, not the ones who wrote, not the disciples who wrote the, the Bible, the apostles, they were the 12 that walked with them. Okay, they misunderstood it. And for the same reasons, anyone misunderstands it because that's what was taught until the disciples wrote the Bible. Their own imperfect love made them vulnerable to projection. And out of their own fear, they spoke of the wrath of God as his retaliatory weapon. Now, there's no retaliation from God. Okay, so there is no wrath of God. You know, we love to quote that in movies, especially um, the Pulp Fiction-y ones. But it's not true. There's no vengeance and retaliation from God. Because what would he be retaliating against but himself? Because God knows the entire universe and the sonship as an extension of himself. An extension in the son's mind, not in God's mind. 
nor could they speak of the crucifixion entirely without anger. Because why? Because the guilt's still there, because their sense of guilt had made them angry. And these are some of the examples of upside down thinking in the New Testament. Okay. Although, although its gospel is really only, only the message of love, the gospel of Jesus, obviously. In the, if the apostles had not felt guilty, which they, of course, did, they, they could never have quoted me as saying, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. And that always bothered me as a child, because it's not a correct interpretation of what he said. This is clearly the opposite of everything I taught, nor could they have described my reaction to Judas as they did if they had already, if they really understood me. I, would, I could not have said, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? Why? Jesus set the whole thing up. It was scripted. He came to demonstrate resurrection ascension. Okay. The whole message of the crucifixion was simply that, that I did not. The punishment I was said to have called forth upon Judas was a similar mistake. Judas was my brother and the son of God equally as much as part of the sonship as myself. So Judas, the one we blame for Jesus' death, was my brother, Jude James, okay, and son of God, as much as part of the whole sonship as myself. Was it likely that I, that I would be, sorry, that I would condemn him, condemn him when I readily, well, sorry, when I was re ready to demonstrate that condemnation is Sin, guilt, fear is impossible. As you read the teachings of the apostles, remember that I told them myself that there was much they would understand later because they were not wholly ready to follow me at the time. I do not want you to follow any fear, sorry, to allow any fear to enter into the, your thought system to which I'm guiding you. I do not call for martyrs, but for teachers. I seek mercy, not sacrifice. Forgiveness, not sacrifice. More to sacrifice. No one is punished for their sin. And the sons of God are not sinners. They're just dreaming. And any concept of punishment involves the projection of blame and reinforces the idea that blame is justified. The result is a lesson in blame. The result is war, war, war. And war machines. And if you listen to the news, it's all about more machines, more war machines, more attack, more attack, more, more, more. We want to stay stuck in the war, as opposed to calling for, sit down the, around the table, let's negotiate a peaceful end. For all behavior teaches, for all behavior teaches the, the beliefs that motivated. The crucifixion was the result of clearly opposed thought system, the perfect symbol of conflict between ego and the son of God. Now remember that the son of God cannot be in conflict with the ego, because the ego is false and the son of God is true as the self. This conflict seems just as real now as the lessons, as its lessons must be learned now as well as then. I do not need gratitude, and this is so vital. I urge us when you're on someone's Facebook page, you read through it, a like, gratitude, and your gratitude grows. I'm always amazed how you get like a thousand people reading it, 10,000 people reading it, five likes. Because no one got gratitude. They read it. They enjoyed it. Give your gratitude. So Jesus is saying, I don't need your gratitude. I need you to be grateful for you. Because when you're grateful, you lift yourself above the battlefield. It's not that I need your gratitude. I don't need your praise. I need you to feel those things so you can lift out of it. But you need to develop your weakened ability to be grateful, or you cannot appreciate God. And if you cannot appreciate God, you can't know God. And I'm not talking conceptually, but the existential knowing of God as the essence of yourself. It becomes real for you, and it becomes a blissful reality. He does not need your appreciation, but you do. So he needs you to be appreciative for you, not because he needs your appreciation. You cannot love what you do not appreciate. For fear makes appreciation impossible. And so we try and conquer it. 
conquering it how? By making it into a body mind and then attacking it. It's the typical way of the military, for example. When you are afraid of, of what you do not appreciate, sorry, when you are afraid of what you are and what you are, you do not appreciate it and will therefore reject it. So when you're afraid of what you are, you'll reject what you are because you don't understand it. As a result, you will teach the rejection as a way to live your life. Why? Because you, it's worked for you, although it'll be temporary. The power of the sons of God, and now it's talking sons as in the split off characters of the one son, the, spirit, the, the, spirit of, the split off characters, which is us, is present all the time because they are created as creators. That's what we were made as, created as. Their influence, our influence on each other is without limit and must be used for our joint salvation. Each one must learn to teach that all forms of rejection are meaningless. What are you rejecting? Fragments of yourself. By And who's doing the rejection? Fragments of yourself. The separation is the notion of rejection. So what does separation really stand for? The rejection of God's son, the death of God's son, which is not possible. As long as you teach this, you will believe it. And people do because it serves them in having that specialness in their relationship. Okay? This is not as God thinks. And you must think as he thinks if you are to know him again. Remember that the Holy Spirit is the communication link. Why? It's the memory between God and God the Father and his separated sons, the fractured parts of the dreamer's mind. As they awaken, the dreamer awakens. Communication with God is not lacking. If you will listen to his voice, the voice in the dream, you will know that you can, cannot either hurt or be hurt. And that and the, true of you, the truth of you, the essence of you, so the physical body-mind projection, yes, you can set it by. And that many need your blessings, your sharing, your joyous gratitude, okay, to help them hear this for themselves. When you perceive only this need in them and do not respond to any other, especially with anger, you have learned of me and will be as eager to share your learning as I am. Because you will realize the I am in me is the I am in Christ. Therefore, the I am in all. The only difference is he got it first and fully awoke. I'm awakening to it. They still haven't got a cooking clue, but I'm going to share it anyway, because as I share it, it is shared amongst my self, capital S self, and the collective mind absorbs it. I'll stop here and then we'll get answers and some questions. Questions and answers. We now move to section three of text, A Course in Miracles, chapter six. Um, the lessons of love. And the, we now move into an alternative way of seeing the world through our human eyes. Okay, sorry that I'm humanizing us because we're not human, we're spirit. We're not spirit having a human experience. We're spirit having an experience we've called human, but it's not. It's no human. Our humanness, when, we, when humans refer to our humanness, what they're really saying is our unconditional love. That's what true humanness is. The alternative to projection. And here it is. And one of you just asked me a question two minutes ago. You know, when I know that the, the truth is up there, it's the wholeness of it. But what happens when I'm in this, what we call the real world, you know, this physical world, then the anxiety, the fear, it's all here. Of course it is. Why? Because you've given your allegiance to wrong-minded ego. When you step above the battlefield, where's the anxiety if there's no you to personalize? The minute you take you body, you body mind out of the equation and you are pure spirit, can spirit feel anxiety? Or is it only the body mind that perceives wrong-mindedness as anxiety? Okay. So any split mind any split, any fracture in the mind, which is not possible, it just believes it is, must involve rejection of part of it. And yes, one of the fundamental flaws of the falling asleep dreamer, the sense of being rejected 
by that which created us. And because we've been rejected, we must be unworthy. And if we're unworthy, we're not good enough. Woe is me, I'm not good enough. And now we look to make ourselves special to appease that which we have conceptualized as the God which created us since we cannot remember what God is. And because we're in fear, we then start to project, assume fearful properties onto God and they start and therefore start to fear God. Hence why the early versions of the Bible says God needs to be feared, which is a very plausible explanation for wrong-minded duality ego, but completely absurd to that which knows itself as the extension of love and what is love, the extension of God. So any split mind must involve a rejection of part of it. And this is the belief in separation. Separation is happening in a split off part of our mind or a belief that it can be split off. How do we know this? Because a part of the mind has ascended through the demonstration of Jesus. Therefore, a part of our mind is fully awake, realizing that in this world, of illusions, anything can be transcended from a right-minded, holy mind, miracle-minded perspective. The wholeness of God in which he's peace cannot be appreciated except by a whole mind that recognizes the wholeness of God's creation. So the wholeness of God, for you to recognize it, means it must be in you or you wouldn't recognize it. So it cannot be appreciated except by a whole mind that recognizes the wholeness of God's creation because it's completely create wholeness. And you say, but hang a second, I look at this universe, I look at this world and the injustice of it. How can it be the wholeness of God? It isn't. God has nothing to do with this world. And those people that want to say that God created the world and then put us here in seven days and Adam and Eve and ribs and spare ribs and sons and daughters murdering each other and eating poison apples and talking to us. This is nonsense, absolute fairy tale, egoic nonsense made up by a split off mind that believes it to be separated from its source. The very fact that God walked around, you know, God of Eden saying, Adam, Adam, where are you? I can't find you. God can't find Adam. He created all of them. All of that, you got to throw all of that out. Baby bath water, the whole damn shoot. It's all nonsense. And, and, and choose to give the authority, the guardianship of your mind, of you, of the real essence of what you are, to the memory of God, God's Holy Spirit, in you, the very essence of you, temple, heart. By this recognition, it knows its creator. Because you'll only recognize what you are when you understand and know yourself knowingly as that which you are. As Jesus would say, I am that I am. Exclusion and separation are synonymous. What is this course trying to teach us? The lessons of love. The alternatives to projection. And here it is. Exclusion and separation are synonymous. As are separation and disassociation. And remember, so many of our spiritual people, we get to a certain point, we want to sell everything, give everything up, wear curtains as clothes, get all grungy, look like a hippie, bohemian, live in the mountain, a caravan, give it all up, reject it all. You're rejecting yourself. It's all you. You can't awaken through exclusion and separation. You, can't have, you cannot wake up through separation and disassociation. It's all you. You are responsible for all of it. But most of it is create, made from an ego delusional mind. So you want to now step out of that brought into illusion where you've personalized it, step above the battlefield and give the guardianship of your mind to that which enlightens the mind in truth, the Holy Spirit in you. We have said before that the separation was and is dissociation. Okay, so do not detach from this world. Be non-attached to this world. And once it occurs, Projection becomes the main defense. So it's happening to me, and you're making me feel this way. And so then I defend against you, which means I attack you. Okay. And so it becomes the main defense or the device for keeping it going, the ego device, the belief in separation. 
The reason, however, may not be so obvious as you think. What you project, you disown. And so when you see something that you don't like, guess where it is? You, the projectionist. And therefore, you've now disowned it, projected it outside. You, you no longer believe it's you. And then what do you do? You attack it. And what happens? It it's a mirror because it's you. It responds based on your belief behavior. And so if you attack something you've disowned, what you've disowned attacks you. Now, you may not physically attack, but you may have an attack thought. It may, however, appear as a physical attack because either neither physicality nor thought are any different or any more real than each other. They're both illusions. And so the appearance of attack, well, why is this happening to me? I had a negative thought. It happens, but I didn't tell anyone I didn't like you. Why, am, why are you attacking me? Because I had I didn't like you thoughts, attack projected, and now you're attacking me. And so what you project, you disown, and therefore you do not believe it's yours, but this entire universe is. Holy son of God, you are excluding yourself by the very judgment that you are different from the one on whom you project. Okay, And so by excluding, there's no way you can awaken because awakening is the whole. Since you have also judged against what you project, you continue to attack it because you continue to keep it separated outside yourself, not realizing it was all thought up here first. By doing this unconsciously, and you do it naturally because you've been programmed that way, you try and keep the fact that you've attacked yourself out of your awareness. There's the magic word. And you want to keep it out of your awareness understanding. And thus, imagine that you have made yourself safe. Why? Because I now can build defenses against what attacks me, not realizing you've created the attack and it's going to reciprocate and no matter what defenses you build, no matter where you go, move to Australia, buy a sheep farm, the attack in your mind is going to present itself on the sheep farm in Australia. Why? Because it's in you. And so whenever there's an attack towards you, an insult or whatever, look within and find this. And if you cannot find it, just ask to be shown and ask Holy Spirit, the memory of God, to release it. So it's the light in you releases the illusion of darkness. Yet projection will always hurt you and has to this day. So if you're wondering why your life has been challenging and why you eventually got to the Course in Miracles, it's because it wasn't working out. And why wasn't it working out? Because you didn't realize that everything that attacked you was a projection made by you or your wrong-minded view on what you are. Wrong-minded, your egoic view on what you are. So it reinforces your belief in your own split mind. And its only purpose is to keep the separation going within yourself. Attack, defend, attack, defend. It's solely a device of the ego to make you feel different from your brother, different, special, victim or aggressor, and separated from them. They are the useless and lazy, you have to do everything, or they're attacking you because you're unworthy. And the ego justifies this on the ground that it makes you seem better, more special than they are, thus obscuring your equality them with still further, them still further. Projection and attack are in inevitably related. Of course they are, because they're two sides of the same coin, and you are the coin. Because projection is always a means of justifying attack, because you'll get every single reason in the book why you justify it. And if you look at any ism, racism, discrimination, sexism, there's always a justification for the behavior back then for some reason. And they will then continue it if you can justify the behavior further. Don't. Anger without projection is impossible. Because how can you get angry if there's nothing that you can get angry with? Because you can only get angry once you project it. And if you project out of anger, what are you projecting? You're projecting anger. That's re reflecting the anger within you. The ego uses projection only to destroy your perception, your preception, your understanding of both yourself and your brothers. The process begins by excluding something that exists in you, but which you don't want, something that you disown, as it said earlier on. 
and leads to directly excluding you from your brothers. So you, you can, as a man judges, so he is judged. Why? Your judgment becomes a judgment against you by your own making. God does not judge. Let's change it up. We have learned, however, there is an alternative to projection. Every ability the ego has, of the ego, has a better use because of its abilities are directed by the mind which has a better voice. So all that you've made, this entire universe, your own life, your own world, your own experience, can be changed to serve your peace of mind if given to the Holy Spirit to take command of your thoughts and, and, your, and your mind. The Holy Spirit extends. In other words, the extension, what is extending? Love. And the ego projects. As, as their goals are opposed, so is the result. Ego will keep you trapped in conflict. Holy Spirit lifts you above the battlefield. Holy Spirit be begins by perceiving you as perfect because he's in the dream he's perceiving. In, in, in heaven, where there's no dream state, he knows you as perfect. Knowing this perfection is shared, he recognizes in others, thus strengthening it in both. Okay? So when you give your allegiance to the Holy Spirit, this is how your mind starts to operate because you've given control of your mind to the part of you which is still awake in God, the Holy Spirit God. Instead of anger, this arouses love for both because it establishes inclusion. Perceiving equality, the Holy Spirit perceives, perceives equal needs. What you and your brother need are exactly the same thing, the joy, peace, and love of God. And this invites atonement at one automatically because atonement is, is the one need of this world that is universal. What we all need, atonement to know ourselves as one, holiest, joyous son of God who abides eternally in peace, love, and joy. To perceive yourself this way is the only way in which you can find happiness in the world. And the only way you'll find happiness in the world is if you perceive yourself this way, You'll perceive all your brothers in the same way, and therefore there's nothing to attack the sovereignty of you as God's holy son. So you're safe. That is because it is an acknowledgement that you are not in this world, for the world is unhappy. And so you can only be in a happy place. And so how does this world change to demonstrating what you now see as a happy world? And Eckhart Tolle writes about it in, in, his, in his second book, we called, called it the new earth, which means that the world appears new for you, gentle, joy, happy. The script appears to change. But what's actually changed is not the script has changed. It's the way you see the script playing out has changed because the projectionist has taken all the ego filters out of the way and pure light now shines upon a temporal perception of the world, physicality, but perceives it in a loving way. So the world becomes like heaven to the perceiver, you the decision maker. How else can you find joy in a joyless place except by realizing you are not there? You cannot be anywhere God did not put you. And God created you as a part of him. God didn't put you into the universe, into the world. God knows you're still in part of him, dreaming of a universe in a world. That is both where you are and what you are. Now, this is a vitally important line, as I often say, about just about every other line. You cannot be anywhere where God did not put you and where he put you. That is both where you are and what you are. He put you in the kingdom of heaven. You are the kingdom of heaven. It is completely unalterable. It is total inclusion. You cannot change it now or ever. It remains forever true. It is not a belief, but a fact. Holy Son of God, you are the kingdom of heaven. You are the love of God. Anything that God created is as true as he is. Its truth lies only in its perfect inclusion in him who alone is perfect. Perfect inclusion in him. Not outside him. Not possible. There is nothing outside God because there is nothing but God. To deny this is to deny yourself and him. And later on, the self will be capitalized. To deny yourself as 
God's Holy Son and Him, since it is impossible to accept one without the Father. Father and Son are one. The perfect equality of the Holy Spirit's perception is the reflection of the perfect equality of God's knowing. And so every single fracture, body, mind, spirit, being in the world, in the universe, will be seen in exactly the same way. Why? You've replaced your ego filters with the Holy Spirit's new filter. You're now seeing with the Holy Spirit's eyes, which are actually your eyes, the eyes that have perfect memory of you as God's only son. And so what do you see through the new perceived filter of God's Holy Spirit? Perfection. Beauty everywhere. And things that don't want to be that, you won't see them because they no longer need to play in your dream. The ego's perception has no counterpart in God, but the Holy Spirit remains the bridge between perception and knowledge. So what we call knowledge in this world of this universe, the knowledge of this universe, is the knowing of illusions and therefore isn't true knowledge. No matter how much you study, no matter how many billions of degrees, quantum physics, astrophysics, psychology, biology, mathematics, what you understand is all echoes of the voice of God. None of it's true. Okay. Truth can only be known once you put perception aside. The perception can be very close to truth when you've given your allegiance to Holy Spirit mind. In actual fact, you start to see through truthful eyes. So by enabling you to use perception in a way that reflects knowledge, you will ultimately remember it. Be thyself knowingly is what it's really saying. So by enough time abiding in the presence of God's Holy Spirit as you in the temple, which is the kingdom of God, the memory starts to return. Don't worry, you don't disappear and your puppy doesn't die. Your mother just fades away and your husband or boyfriend or lover or wife and kids dissolve. No, you'll still see them, but you'll see them anew. And so the response to them by you and them and by them to you changes because you are now seeing through the only corrective seeing device, Holy Spirit. So it's like putting on colored glasses and all of a sudden the world just looks full of color because you're seeing through the color, which is the Holy Spirit. The ego would prefer to believe that this memory is impossible. Why? Because the, the ego cannot remember the memory of God because the ego was made after we forgot, we made the memory of the, we made the ego as a part of our forgetfulness. We forgot God and making of the ego is the, we allowed the idea of fear to creep into our dream. Yet it is your perception, the Holy Spirit guides, not trying to fix the ego. The cruc- you, someone mentioned earlier on, and I think it was you about the book, about the crucifixion, about the crucifying of God's son is the only, or the crucifying of the ego is the only way we transcend you know, ego into awakened awareness. You can't crucify that which doesn't exist. You can't destroy, you don't destroy the ego. It simply dissolves. And even that's a wrong word because it never existed. The light comes on and all shadows disappear. We're never there. Shadows aren't real. When you put the light on, you realize shadow has never been there. It's not real. It just was perceived with the lack of light. Your perception will end where it began. And where did it begin? began when you were in God. So it'll end in God. Everything meets in God because everything was created by him and in him, and you are in him because you were created by him. Okay? God created his, his, his sons by extending his thoughts and retaining the extension of the thoughts in his mind. What are you? You're a thought in God's mind. You're a thought that has dreamt the dream and now appears to have taken form. You're a thought in form. Okay? But you are still retained and still retained as an extension in the loving thoughts of God's mind. You are the love of God. All his thoughts are thus perfectly united with themselves and each other because they're all unlike unto themselves. The Holy Spirit, the memory of God, enables you to perceive this wholeness now while you're here in this world. Does the script now change? No. Script continues. Your perception of the script changes. And so what was going to seem like a hell of a life, a horrible, horrible life, is just going to be amazing. And people are going to say, how come you're so happy? How come you're always so nice to everybody? How come you always treat everybody in such kindness? How come you're always giving of yourself to everybody? Because the script has changed. 
And now I see with Holy Spirit eyes. And so I see the equality of God's sonship in all equally as all extensions of myself, the dreamer, full responsibility. So how can I treat anything which I know I've created in any negative, unfair or ugly way? To love all of it, even if it's behaving badly, which of course nowadays I won't see it behaving badly because I'll only see the, the aspects that are reflecting me back at me. God created you to create. What do you create? God created love. So what do you create? The extension of love. You cannot extend his kingdom until you know of its wholeness, for you are the wholeness of God's kingdom, for you are the kingdom, as explained in chapter 5. Thoughts begin in the mind of the thinker from which they reach outward. This is as true of God, God's thinking, as it is of yours. And God's thinking produced you, you as the extension of God's love. When you think with God, what do you do? You, you extend love just as God extended you. And so what happens? You start to see everything as your loving creation. So you love your creations because it's all you. You may have mis misperceived it, and a part of it still sees itself as a warring machine, but you see all of it as love, and you don't see it as a warring machine because the minute you see it as, as love, the warring machine ceases to be a war, war, warring machine and becomes a machine of love. Because your mind is split, you can perceive and think as well. Now look at this. Perceive and think are the same thing. Yet perception cannot escape the basic laws of mind. What is the basic laws of mind? Nothing can be, nothing leaves its source. Okay? Nothing can be separated from the mind that thinks. it. You perceive from your mind and project your, your perceptions outwards. You project your misperceptions outwards. Although perception of any kind is unreal, you made it. And the Holy Spirit can therefore use it as well. And because you made it, you now see a world projected and perceived. So now the Holy Spirit takes this. He can inspire perception and lead it towards God. In other words, get rid of the faltering ego mind judgments of it. Clear it, cleans the lens until there's only the purity of Holy Spirit memory lens left behind. This convergence seems to be far in the future only because your mind is not in perfect alignment with the idea. If it was, you'd realize there's no far away in the future and it becomes your present awareness here now and therefore doesn't want it now. The Holy Spirit uses time but does not believe in time. Okay? Coming from God, he uses everything for, for good, but he does not believe in what is not true. So he sees it and he reinterprets it for you. And it's changing the way you perceive the script is written. Since the Holy Spirit is in your mind, in fact, the Holy Spirit is the right part of your mind, and therefore the right part of your mind is the only true part of your mind, therefore the only truth about you, you are the Holy Spirit. You are that which contains the memory of God. Your mind can also believe only what is true. The Holy Spirit can speak only for this because he speaks for God. And so in this world, we need to make a decision. Do I some days let the Holy Spirit speak and some days let the ego, which will just keep me in bound confusion, or do I release myself from the bondage of ego, sin, fear, and guilt and give my allegiance to right-mindedness? In other words, I choose to no longer judge. Show me another way to see this. He tells you how to return, and this is it, because your mind is still in God but it's about you remembering that you are. So this line is a bit of a play on words. He tells you to return your whole mind to God. In other words, your mind whole. Because it is never left. Okay. It is never left. You've never left God. All your anxiety, all your shit, all the problems that you're having is because you've bought into the idea that it's possible to be somewhere where you're not. And that where you're not is possible. If it, had, if it has never left it, you need only perceive it as to be returned. It's not actually returning anything. It's just realize it's already still there. The full awareness of the atonement, the joining, then is the recognition that the separate separation 
never occurred. The illusion of the universe never occurred. Whoa. Why do I still imagine it? Because I haven't let go of the idea of sin, fear, and guilt, and the idea that I'm not a body, I'm free, I'm still as God created me. The ego cannot prevail against this because it is an explicit statement that the ego never occurred. And the, there's no way the ego will entertain this. And it'll, damn it, it'll write a Bible to prove that it's so. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> couldn't help. The ego can accept the idea that return is necessary because it can so easily make the idea seem difficult. So let's just grasp this. The ego can accept the idea that return is necessary because it can so easily make the idea seem difficult. So it lets you accept the idea, makes it easy at first, and then says, okay, let's throw some obstacles to peace here. Yet the Holy Spirit tells you that even return is unnecessary because what never happened cannot be difficult. You've never left the kingdom. You've not sinned, prodigal son. You're just in your father's home dreaming you've gone on an adventure. However, you can make the idea of return both necessary and difficult. Now look here, not create the idea, make the idea. Make and create opposes each other. Ego makes spirit, Holy Spirit, extends or creates extension and creating is the same yet it is surely clear that the perfect need nothing and nothing you desire for nothing because you have everything and you cannot experience perfection as a difficult accomplish accomplishment because that is what you are this is the way in which you must perceive god's creation bringing all of your perceptions into one line the holy spirit sees this line is the direct line of communication with God and lets your mind converge with this. So it's where you, Holy Spirit, become one in the recognition that the Holy Spirit is the memory of God in you as you. And then this line, this line is the direct line of communication because it's God's Holy Spirit communicating with God. We thought it was an entity. Now we realize it's in us. Then we realize it is us. So if my Holy Spirit is communicating with God, I am in direct communication with God always why factually because you've never left you're still in him and so you are a thought in god and therefore the thoughts you have with god are the thoughts of god in god and you are the son which he so loves and is perfect can never change are you willing to accept this because if you're not it won't you won't allow it to filter in because the ego is like no 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 I, I like the idea but you know what let me just stay here love god worship god go to church pray meditate God me. This is saying, no, no. God sends his Holy Spirit in the dream. Holy Spirit's a memory of him. Since you are the son of God, the memory and the son are one and the same. When the son of God and the memory of God become one in the recognition that it is you, then, then you realize, but if I'm one with that, which is the Holy Son and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's the extension of God, and can't be left, can't leave God, then I must still be there. Willing to see it that way? And it is shown. It, it will be so quick. It, it'll just put a smile on your face. And you go, how on earth did I see this before? Well, it's taken 16 billion years to get you. There is no conflict anywhere in this perception. Because it means that all perception is guided by the Holy Spirit. And so it becomes right-minded perception. Temporal perception, the bridge towards heaven. Whose mind is fixed on God. Only. The Holy Spirit can resolve conflict because only the Holy Spirit is conflict free. So he just doesn't avoid it. It just dissolves in the light of your newfound awareness. So what was conflict then becomes a lesson in appreciation because you realize I needed this conflict in order to realize I was creating it. And now that I realize I'm creating it, I forgive it and myself and in the appearance of what happens to the others. And as I've forgiven it in what appears to be others and in myself, it dissolves forget and forgive and forget about it forget about it okay like they say in the bronx he perceives only what is true in your mind and extends outward only to what is true in other minds so the truth in every other mind which is extensions of your mind reignite and join in the truth of one singularity mind the difference between the ego's projection and the Holy Spirit extension is very simple. 
the ego projects to exclude and therefore is therefore to deceive exclude deceive walk different paths the holy spirit extends by recognizing himself in every mind so the holy spirit extends in every mind okay realizing i am the memory in every mind of that which i am and thus perceives them as one because if one has the same as every other one then they must be one nothing conflicts in this perfection sorry nothing conflicts in this perception right minor perception because what the holy spirit perceives is all the same and therefore can have no conflict if everything is equally the same what's it fighting against it wouldn't recognize division separation difference wherever he looks he sees himself and because he's united he offers the whole kingdom always what are you you're the holy son of god what is the memory of god in you it's the holy spirit wherever you look you see him yourself and because you are united in oneness in atonement with all the of creation you offer the whole kingdom to everyone always this is the one message god gave to him for which he must speak because that is what he is that is what you are the son of god the peace of god lies in that message and so the peace of god lies in you again referring it's in you god's holy spirit the great the great peace of the kingdom shines in your mind forever but it must shine outwards to make you aware of it and how do you become aware of it to have love give love to have peace give peace to have everything give everything okay because you are the kingdom the holy spirit was given you so or you could even put it this way your holy spirit was given you with perfect impartiality and only by recognizing him impartially can you recognize him at all meaning you need to recognize him in everyone and everyone means all the ego is is legion but the holy spirit is one legion takes sides go to battle legionnaires no darkness abides anywhere in the kingdom but your part is only to allow no darkness to abide in your own mind now your mind is the fallen asleep part in the kingdom but once you awaken the fallen asleep is now awake never existed darkness doesn't exist so lots of people like to say but you need the darkness to know the light well you need to go through that experience until you recognize you are the light the minute you recognize you are the light you enlighten you extend that light what happens to the darkness this appears because it was never there in truth this alignment with light is unlimited because it is an alignment with the light of the world of which you are it each of us is the light of the world every single one of us is meant to be it because we are the light of god's life and we are the love of god and when we awaken to this reality our perception of ourselves changes into this reality being the kingdom and by joining our minds in this light we proclaim the kingdom of god together as one since we are one kingdom of god i'll stop there now we move to text chapter 6 lesson of love 6.4 the relinquishment of attack giving up the idea of not only attacking but that attack is possible since you are the dreamer dreaming up all those characters any character you attack you're attacking a part of yourself so it's saying okay i'm my head and my hand is not good so i chop off my hand you're going to feel pain at the wrist and then you wonder bo oh, someone's hurting my wrist no you chopped it off you chopped off the hand it's you you can't attack your hand and not hurt yourself it's all you in the same way this entire universe is you everyone is you and any form of attack even resistance or complaining about someone you're attacking yourself so instead of using your voice your tension your energy to attack someone when you're about to attack them use them as use that as an opportunity to realize i'm in wrong mind with this what's another way to see this bless them rather just give them a blessing and because them still is seen outside you give them a blessing and then recognize but they are reflecting a part of me which i've disowned so the relinquishment of attack means as we have already emphasized 
every idea begins in the mind of the thinker. So God thought you up, and therefore you began in God's mind and still remains there as an extension of God's love. Therefore, what extends from the mind is still in it. So extension of it is an extension of it, not a breaking off and floating away. It's extended from it, therefore still a part of it. And from what it extends, it knows itself. And yes, again, know thyself. The, the wonderful teaching in all the temples in Greece and Rome and all the great old teaching, the esoteric old ancient mystical teachings, to thyself be true. Know thyself with certainty, Jesus taught us. The word knows is correct here. Knows. Because the Holy Spirit is still, still holds the knowledge safe in your mind through his impartial perception. So the Holy Spirit holds knowledge safe in your mind. Knowledge, the memory, the knowing of God. By attacking nothing, this is how you start to perceive the world, he presents no barriers to the communication of God within you in your knowing. Can you imagine when you actively, consciously, presently know that the very essence of you is the essence of God? Can you imagine how your world changes in ways you can't even comprehend because your comprehension is based on what you know in the world, ego knowing, limitations of ego knowing. Imagine removing all limitations. You could fly if you needed to. You wouldn't want to because you realize that flying is stupid. It doesn't exist. Why would I want to fly when I'm all of it? Therefore, being is never threatened. Being is what you are, the beingness of you. Watch these words so beautifully, so carefully. Your godlike, godlike mind. Your godlike mind. Let's repeat it one more time. Your godlike mind can never be defiled. So, what is defiled? A part of your mind which isn't real if we're not a part of your mind. It's just a tiny mad idea. The ego never was and never will be part of it. Again, Holy Son of God, you do not have an ego. You have an Holy, a Holy Spirit. What does the ego convince you? That you are the ego. And then later stage, it, it, doesn't, it hates you and then uses your ego projection, your body to attack you. That gets in the next section. But it's for now, let's say the ego never was and never will be a part of it. But through the ego, you can hear and teach and learn what is not true. So you can believe in that tiny false mad idea and therefore behave from the foundational premises that you are a body that can be attacked, that can be harmed, that can kill and can be killed. You have taught yourself to believe that you are not what you are. You have taught yourself to believe that you are not what you are. You cannot teach what you have not learned. And what you teach, you strengthen in you because you are sharing it. So if you teach something you haven't learned, you're teaching falsely. If you believe incorrectly, you're teaching falsely. So the foundation of all dogma, religion in this world, if the foundation is wrong, the teachings as a consequence are wrong. And how can you then correct it later on when the foundation, you've got to go and destroy the whole damn thing. Unless you hand the whole damn thing to the Holy Spirit and he just reverses it for you and uses the whole damn thing to bring you to awakening. Every lesson you teach, you are learning. Why? As you teach it, you reinforce it. And this is why the course calls for teachers for God and calls every student of the course a teacher for God, because it's calling you to teach it verbally, through your actions, through your thoughts, through your being. And as you teach, so you become that which you know you are. Ego says, but you can teach incorrectly, and so too, you holy son of God, then believe you become something you're not, because you are the powerful creator that is the son of God. 
So if you cr create incorrectly, make incorrectly, or extend correctly, they're both true for you. Choose who you put in guardianship, the authority, who do you give the authority of your mind to? Of your thoughts, in other words, mind, cluster of thoughts. Ideas clustered together, and then identified as you. Who do you give it to? Holy Spirit. It shows you another way to see it. That is why you must teach only one lesson. If you are to be conflict-free yourself, you must learn only from the Holy Spirit and teach only by him. So be very careful that when you're teaching, you're teaching from a place of peace and not trapped with what happened during the day, what's happening to me, I'm a victim of the world, because then you're going to give the victim of the world to the students and you're going to, and you're going to be projecting your anger and disdain of the world and you're going to make it real for them. Don't. Imagine Jesus teaching, you know, they won't believe what those Romans did. They beat me up and nailed me to the cross. You don't hear him speak like that. Jesus says, laugh at all of it. It wasn't real. I didn't suffer. It's not true. It'll make us feel guilty for it. You are only love. But when you deny this, you, you make what you are something. You must learn to remember. Okay. So you are only love. But when you deny this, you make what you are something you must learn to remember. So because we have denied this, we now have to try and remember what we are through a process. And yet it's still in us. I said before that the message of the crucifixion was teach only love for that is what you are. This is the one lesson that is perfectly united because it is the own, it's the only lesson that is one. United means one anyway. Only by teaching it can you learn it. As you teach it, so you will learn because you will learn it is true for you and it will grow within you as you extend it to others. If that is true, and it is true indeed, do not forget that what you teach is teaching you, it's reinforcing in you, and what you project or extend you believe. So let's extend rather than project and let it teach us from a state of extension. The only safety lies in extending the Holy Spirit, the truth of you. Because as you see his gentleness in others, your own mind perceives itself as totally harmless. Because we can never see our beauty within us. So we can see beauty in the world. But recognize if you're seeing beauty in the world you're perceiving, it must be in you or you would not see it at all. Once it can accept, once it can accept this fully, it sees no need to protect itself. The protection of God then draws upon it. Why I'm in God and forever safe. Even if I'm dreaming of this, I'm still in God and forever safe. Assuring it that it is perfectly safe forever in God, in the kingdom, as the kingdom. The perfectly safe are wholly benign, willing to share of themselves completely, positively, in the most deeply caring way. They bless because they know that they are blessed. Without anxiety, the mind is wholly kind. And because it extends benefits, it is benefic beneficent. Blah. Okay. So the minute you realize that you are not in total peace, realize I'm in wrong mindedness. Step out of it. Show me another way to see it. And the minute I do this, and I'm wholly kind because all anxiety, fear is gone, I now want to benefit everybody because I am being benefited by it. Safety is the complete relinquishment of attack. So only those that are fearful attack and defend. And if you're completely without fear, there's nothing to attack and defend. And because you have no attack thoughts, you're never attacked. Remember, if you have no attack thoughts, attack's impossible. It's only when you have attack thoughts that attack is possible. Ask me. I was perfect walking, talking example of that 20, 30 years ago. No compromise on this is possible at all. Okay. Teach attack in any form and you've learned it. And it will hurt you. I mean, in martial arts, they say attack is the best form of defense. And so it becomes that. You learn this to learn to protect yourself before you know it these attack thoughts and defend attack thoughts become continuous attacks. There it go, it stops. Yet this learning is not immortal. 
and you can unlearn it by not teaching it. Since you cannot not teach, you're always teaching. Your salvation lies in teaching the exact opposite of everything the ego believes, right-minded thinking. This is how you will learn the truth that will set you free because the truth that will set you free is in you to be remembered by you, we call that learning, and will keep you free as others learn it of you. The only way to have peace is to teach peace. Um, Wayne Dyer wrote a lot about this because he was a course student. In actual fact, he named the book similar to that. By teaching peace, you must learn it yourself because you cannot teach what you still dissociate. Of course you will. If you don't, if you don't believe it's part of you, why would you teach it's true? Only thus can you win back the knowledge that you threw away when you chose to fall asleep and forget you were the Holy Son of God. An idea that you must have, it awakens in your mind through the conviction of teaching it. The more you teach it, the more you know you have it, the more it works for you, the more it reinforces in you, the more it becomes you. Everything you teach, you are learning because it's reinforcing. It says this over and over again. Teach only love and, and, and learn that love is yours and that you are love. Beautiful. You stop there. And I hope that this has brought a deeper and clearer understanding to these wonderful teachings. Next week, we will continue um, with uh, chapter 6.5, the only answer. We'll try and wrap that up next week.